In this film, we have decided to include extremely distressing and graphic images of violence, of wounds inflicted under torture, of the battered bodies of Syrian civilians killed under torture, and even of torture being carried out, openly filmed by the perpetrators themselves. Images so disturbing that they cannot be shown on the evening news. The United Nations now believes 5,000 Syrian civilians have been killed since March. Tens of thousands of people have been arrested and pushed through a detention system where torture is endemic. The president is in denial. We don't kill our people. Nobody kill, no government in the world kill its people unless it's led by crazy person. But thousands of videos showing violent repression have been uploaded to the internet and circulated by online opposition television channels. The government says these videos are fake. But just last week, the UN accused the Syrian regime of committing crimes against humanity. Our investigation forensically examines video footage and witness testimony to determine whether there is prima facie evidence of widespread and systematic repression and torture carried out by the Syrian state against the Syrian people. All the footage in this film has been verified by independent experts. The Syrian regime would have the world believe that the Arab Spring brought the promise of reform to Syria, that some minor problems persist, but that everything is normal. In reality, Syria is in turmoil. The government has refused to grant journalists and human rights observers free access to the country. But I've been given a rare journalist visa. Our movements are heavily restricted, and we're only permitted one trip outside Damascus to the southern city of Dara. No one is free to talk to us because we are always surrounded by the feared Mukhabarat, Bashar al-Assad's secret police. Back in March, a group of 15 schoolboys, the youngest ones just 10, spray-painted graffiti on a wall which said, Down with the regime of Bashar al-Assad. Trouble was, the boys got caught. When a local clansman went to try to get them out of detention, he was told by the local army commander, no way. And when he went back to his people to report what had happened, they decided to hold a demonstration against the government. The first demonstration. And the rest is history. This is one of the schoolboys detained in Dera. They were finally released, but bruised and bloodied. Some had had their fingernails pulled out. The ruthless treatment of the children caused revulsion and triggered spontaneous demonstrations. They were brutally crushed. It was a massive crackdown. Bullets, tanks, arrests and torture. Some of this was caught on mobile phone cameras by protesters and by soldiers. But the more they cracked down, the more the protests spread. And the trickle of such footage making its way onto the internet soon became a flood. This shocking footage was filmed during an army raid in Homs on the 7th of September. Those who defy the regime are hunted down. Mass roundups, whole streets, hundreds at a time. Here, the boy in the green shirt has been targeted for arrest. Homs. A city known as the capital of the revolution. Detainees are softened up by soldiers before they're handed over to the Mukhabarat, the secret police. Syrian intelligence is under the direct control of President Bashar al-Assad. 
There are thousands of videos like this, filmed by soldiers and depicting the first stage in the production line of torture. Some of it's been sold, some of it circulated as trophy pictures, some uploaded simply to intimidate. <laughs> These special forces soldiers are tormenting a civilian. His ankles are bound to an assault rifle so the soles of his feet can be whipped. The man's name is Loe Abdul Hakim Al Amr, a teacher respected by his students and loved by his six children. <laughs> Hakim Al Amr was caught by these soldiers on the 7th of August in his village near Homs. Exactly what happened after this remains a mystery. But five days later, Hakim Al Amr was sent home to his family, dead. His body bore the telltale marks of torture. For four decades, under the rule of Bashar al-Assad and his father, Syrians have lived with knowledge of what will happen if they step out of line. The best way to describe torture in Syria today is that it's rampant, and your odds are, if you're detained, that you will be ill-treated and most likely tortured. We've documented in our records as far back as the 70s people being detained and tortured. Now what's striking this year is just that the torture and the cases of torture have expanded exponentially because people are challenging the regime more. This is not isolated incidents. I mean, this is a pattern. <laughs> So many people are being rounded up that they're often held in schools or football stadiums. In smaller towns and villages, market squares suffice. The interrogators like to show their detainees who's boss. In many videos, they demand the men declare their loyalty to Assad. <laughs> More than 30,000 videos have now been posted on the internet. We assembled a team of independent experts to verify the footage in this film. We cross-corroborated sources, checked for time-specific clues and studied locations. A forensic pathologist examined footage of wounded people and of dead bodies. A former member of the security forces identified vehicles, uniforms and insignia. Syrian translators listened for regional accents and the records of those uploading videos were scrutinized for consistency and reliability. Dr. Juliet Cohen is a forensic physician who has examined more than a thousand victims of torture to document evidence for medico-legal reports. We first showed her the interrogation of a man from the coastal city of Latakia. <laughs> Yeah, it, it's just very chilling how these people are really not being treated as human beings anymore.
we saw them being blindfolded only halfway through, so they already know the faces of their torturers. I think it was done to increase the fear and to depersonalize them in the eyes of those who are torturing them. They're powerless in the face of a lot of soldiers who, who just basically kick and stamp on their necks. It's pretty grim physical abuse, isn't it? And a lot of pain. You can already see some injuries appearing there. You can get fractured ribs, fractured jaw, where they're stamping on the middle part of the body. You could get damage to internal organs, bleeding from liver, spleen, kidneys. One of the striking characteristics of this, of this material is that it's all filmed on mobile phones. You actually see other mobile phones filming at the same time. It's trophy footage. It's clearly being done with impunity. Everyone's openly filming. I think when you see these clips, you see actually what is the reality in a country where torture is carried out by state agents with apparently complete impunity and people are made to suffer inordinately for no apparent purpose than simply to f terrify and intimidate a population. And that's what really happens with torture. So you have no doubt that what you see in these videos is genuine, that it is real people experiencing horrendous intimidation and suffering? Yes. I've no doubt. I can see the injuries being inflicted and I can see the effect of it on the people. The specialist torture and interrogation techniques of Syria's secret police have never really been much of a secret. But that is the point. There's the ever-present threat the minute you dare to step out of line. What's happening now, though, is that torture is being employed systematically, apparently, on an industrial scale. The Mukhabarat run torture franchise operations throughout Syria. Numerous witnesses tell of a similar pattern of abuse. When detainees arrive at a detention facility, they're usually stripped, beaten again, then crammed into cells, standing room only. Every couple of hours, they're dragged out to be tortured. The most basic, most common, is what they call in Syria, fal'a. Fal'a means, you know, it's, they beat you on the soles of your feet. They can use uh, cables, uh, they can use canes, uh, you know, they've got, they're very sort of imaginative that way. This is the mayor of a district in northern Idlib province being subjected to Falaka for a crime that isn't clear. Again, the technique of tying the ankles to a rifle to secure the mayor's legs. Again, it's filmed by the perpetrators. This is vicious beating for hours. In some cases, you know, the beating is so bad it actually leads to toenails to fall off. These soldiers belong to the elite 4th Armoured Division, identified by the cross swords insignia on epaulets. 4th Armoured is the regime's Praetorian Guard. Commanded by Bashar al-Assad's younger brother Maher, its rank and file is drawn exclusively from the ruling family's Alawite sect. After a kick to the head, the mayor from Idlib passes out. Well over 10,000 Syrians have fled the intensifying violence into neighboring countries. Many have been tortured. Their identities and the location of their safe houses must remain a secret owing to the long reach of Syria's Mukhabarat. In Lebanon, all those who fled still feel far too close to home for comfort. It's 2 a.m. and I've been brought to meet a tractor driver from the Syrian frontier town of Tel Kalak. 
He'd been shot on the foot, randomly, he claimed, by pro-regime militia, as tanks laid siege to Talcalach at dawn. He was blindfolded, he says, and driven to nearby Homs with other detainees, being punched and thrashed all the way. Hamas nazzaluna kaman kalbajuna safuna shi khamsin wahid wa kaman qatlu darab qatlu darab mood ahmar. This is what they call the welcome party. Jalami amru khamsa wa tmani yusini Hamad Hamas mbab wa amar khaddamna saru qabbulu snanu bilbansa شوف هني بغلق بالبامسة صار يشير الأضافر. Over the next 42 days, the tractor driver passed through five different Mukhabarat detention facilities, each offering sadistic variations on a theme. صارت الريح صار فرش يد هاي خشبة يد هاي فيك سمكة من هو اللي عنده جري إلى مفصلات تبع باب إلى كلب جهو أو كلب جهو. He claims he saw at least 200 children in detention, boys and girls. The tractor driver's leg became infected. The flesh is now rotting below the knee, but he's too afraid to go to hospital. Syria's torture machine has been tried and tested, improved and upgraded over four decades. Now it's gone into overdrive. In Syria, torture has long been an instrument of the state. We are investigating video evidence and witness testimony that since the revolt began last March, torture has been employed by Syria's security and intelligence apparatus on an unprecedented scale. In October, a British filmmaker working undercover in Damascus for Channel 4 News was arrested by the Mukhabarat while meeting an activist in a cafe. Sean McAllister and his contact found themselves in the custody of the feared Air Force Intelligence Directorate. When I was taken through the stages, it was clear that it's almost systematic. People were coming and going from the adjacent rooms that were being beaten. They were being held for 20 minutes, beaten, and then moved on. And then new people would arrive. What he witnessed was consistent with the testimony of hundreds of survivors, as documented by the UN and human rights groups. I discovered this, the most awful instrument that they were using on people's backs, and it was made up of one big, thick cable, inside of which were, uh, you know, four regular electricity cables. And at the end, they'd, they'd peeled back the outer casing, so that f the four electrical cables inside were exposed and then even within the four electrical cables the plastic on those were peeled back so that the wiry electrical cable was free at the end. He was held for five days and although never tortured himself he remains deeply shocked by what he'd heard and witnessed. The most horrendous beatings that were on one person it sounded like, and, and, and I thought they were going to kill him. It was just bloody awful. The notorious Air Force branch of the Mukhabarat also raided this man's home and arrested him for taking part in protests. Blindfolded and handcuffed, he was beaten and electrocuted. He was often immobilized inside a car tire, then beaten while suspended from the ceiling. This is a technique we heard about over and over again. <laughs>
He too was shifted around between detention centers. Each time his interrogation and torture would start afresh. Other techniques are sadistically inventive. Among the thousands of victims who've been through Syria's torture machine are children. Everyone we spoke to said they'd encountered children in detention. Three young men detained near the rebellious city of Homs. They're being violently abused by a group of soldiers, one of whom is filming their ordeal. They're accused of gun running. I think the, the torture of children is probably at the heart of this uprising in Syria. This is how it all started. You may be 14 years old, we're going to detain you. And they are putting them in the same detention facilities as the adults for the initial period. And many of them have been tortured. There have also been cases of death in custody for children. 13-year-old Hamza al-Khatin was picked up at a protest in Dara by security forces on the 29th of April. Exactly four weeks later, Hamza's mutilated corpse was delivered to his horrified family. Hamza's fate quickly became a catalyst for further protest. Human rights activists are in no doubt that Hamza was tortured. His swollen body had bullet wounds on the arms and marks consistent with electric shocks. He had lesions, bruises, whip marks and two black eyes. His neck had been broken and his family say his penis had been cut off. Banners at his funeral read, The martyr Hamza al-Khatib killed under torture by Assad's gangs. The Assad government claimed an armed terrorist gang had kidnapped and killed him. So all we know at the end of the day, he was taken into custody by the security services, returned as a, as a dead body to his parents with horrible torture signs, and no explanation, and no one was punished. We know of at least 16 children documented by human rights groups as having been returned to their parents dead. Images of these children killed under torture in detention are by far the most distressing of the videos we've seen. <laughs> This is the moment that the body of 15-year-old Tamar al sharii was returned to his family, who wanted to show the world what had been done to their son. His injuries were similar to Hamza's. A fellow detainee said he'd last been seen at an Air Force intelligence facility in Damascus, and that while tied up, he'd been beaten by eight men with clubs. He was lying bleeding profusely from his ears, his nose, and his eyes. As he cried out for his parents, he was reportedly knocked out with a rifle butt. Amnesty says his legs and skull were fractured and that his body had been riddled with 11 bullets. The United Nations report says the injuries described in Tamra's post-mortem are consistent with torture. In Lebanon, I met a mother who'd watched as the army took away her two teenaged sons. The sons had been arrested because the soldiers couldn't find her husband, who was a wanted man. The youngest of the boys, who's 16, was delivered to the Mukhabarat. His was a terrifying ordeal. Amit 
The boy's mother was in a state of distress, knowing only too well what he'd likely be going through. كيف مضت هال 17 يوم الله اعلم اسهر الليل كان في صوت بنات عم ياكلوا اكل ما بعرف اذا عم يغتصبوهم ولا عم يضربوهم ما بعرف He told me all his captors wanted was a confession it didn't matter what for كهربتا يعني صعب كثير اللعب يعني بكهربوه قبل ما يموت بشوي بشيلوا عنه الكهرباء he now has great difficulty sleeping. He stopped going to school. Even hospitals have been turned into places of terror where wounded demonstrators have been tortured and sometimes killed. The UN and international human rights groups report that doctors and nurses treating injured protesters have also been arrested, tortured and killed. Toby Kadman is a human rights lawyer representing Syrians who are bringing a case against Bashar al-Assad and senior members of the regime. He too has examined evidence of torture and spoken to victims and their families. I've never seen anything quite this bad before, particularly when you're talking about attacks on children, uh, attacks on medical personnel, and actually preventing um, any form of treatment to civilians. He believes the evidence is damning. We have at least one account of a physician who all he wanted to do was to treat civilian casualties and as a result of putting his name on a petition with a number of other doctors he was tortured over a number of days uh, killed and then uh, his body thrown 30 kilometers outside of Damascus um, that's quite how bad it is his body was beaten uh, there were whip marks cuts all over his body and his eyes were gouged a Syrian dentist who's fled to Lebanon is now working as a medic He's treating injured refugees in safe houses because of the pervasive fear they'll be tracked down, even here. Is it often the case that doctors and medical staff who treat demonstrators are themselves then targeted and arrested? Syrian human rights groups claim that at least 250 doctors have been arrested, as well as pharmacists and nurses. Injured protesters have also been attacked in their hospital beds. This is what happened to one protester who went to Homs military hospital with a gunshot wound to his leg. When he was discharged, he was dead. He'd been shot several more times and bore signs of torture. Analyzing this video, our forensic pathologist confirmed gunshot wounds to the face, right arm and chest. The speaker identifies the dead man as Amr Kamal Janayat. Syrian human rights groups have registered the death of a man by that name in Baba Amr district of Homs on the 13th of September. Amnesty International has also documented abuse at Homs military hospital since April. The bodies of those who do not survive torture are often dumped, either with their families or just in the streets where they lived. We know of at least 105 cases of uh, people who were returned from the custody of security services in body bags to their loved ones. 105. And those are the ones that we know of. 
How many more have endured horrible torture but did not die? We're talking in the thousands. Amnesty International now says it has information on 191 such deaths in custody. <laughs> This is the body of Nasir Abdul Hakim. He was arrested in Dara on the same day Human Rights Watch believes that up to 200 people were shot dead around Dara by the security forces. It was almost three weeks before this young man was returned to his family. <laughs> We asked Professor Derek Pounder, a forensic pathologist with extensive human rights experience, to examine some of our Syrian videos. What you can see here, on the top left, you see this, these two lines, and that's a tramline mark, and it's typical of a mark you get when, when you're struck with something like a baton or a stick, which is circular in cross-sectional shape. And so these are all injuries to the back, they're not the place you'd expect accidental injuries of large number like this. So this is clearly assaultive. So what this tells us is that the perpetrators really didn't care at all that the marks showed. Well, absolutely. If they leave this amount of marks on the body, it's, it's an indication. They really don't care. There's no consequence for them, even if there is clear evidence of an assault. The patterns of scars and bruising on this man's back are typical of many of the injuries visible in the videos. So, Professor, this video appears to document the discovery of the body of a man in Homs in late October. And there was just there um, a piece of plastic clearly visible around his neck. This is uh, the kind of plastic ligature, the tie that they're using to bind the wrists uh, of people. Uh, and it's tight around the neck. It would kill anyone if you, if you tightened a, a ligature like that around the neck. So that's a presumptive cause of death, strangulation. But you don't put that plastic cuffs around a corpse, do you? No. And then what they've done is put the ligature around the neck and strangled him to death with the ligature. So this is a homicide. Having carefully reviewed our videos, Professor Pounder concluded that there was consistent evidence of severe ill treatment, which had sometimes been the cause of death. So you have no doubt that the people in these videos have been subjected to serious physical abuse? Yes, I mean, there's strong evidence here, compelling evidence of crude physical violence, uh, strangulation homicide, uh, shootings, and generally uh, assaults. Given the volume of material like this, and we've only looked at a few video clips, there is a suggestion, I think you'd agree, of a pattern? Yes, there's a very distinctive pattern of uh, the type of assault. So we've, we've, got, we've got crude physical violence in an extreme form. It would suggest that what was happening was happening on a wide scale, and it would suggest that what was happening uh, was um, carried out with impunity. And so while none of this is definitive, you would say with your expertise that there is sufficient evidence here to warrant serious investigation of cause of death of these people. Oh, absolutely. Uh, there's enough evidence here, if you like, in a, in, in a normal civil context to say there needs to be a homicide investigation. An independent investigation is exactly what international human rights groups are demanding. The key question is who is ultimately responsible? Syria is now drifting into civil war. It's very complex with layers of sectarian and ethnic strife, but at its heart it's simple. A rogue regime has turned on its own people, people whose crime is to have called for change. These soldiers belong to the elite 4th Armored Division, commanded by the president's brother. This division has been at the heart of the regime's fight back against the uprising and has a reputation for brutality. This is clearly a trophy video. After abusing their victim, they pose for a group photo.
But not all the military are so loyal to the al-Assad regime as to be willing to kill their compatriots. There are now thousands of army defectors, mostly conscripts who have had enough. Some have fled into neighboring Lebanon. This defector is a platoon commander. He just arrived in a safe house. He'd been shot nine times by loyalist troops. It's taken two weeks for him to be smuggled safely into Lebanon, where his terrible wounds are being treated by a dentist and his brother, a vet. There's real concern that the Syrian regime will hunt down their opponents, so the wounded still fear going to hospital, even in Lebanon. The regime claims these armed gangs and terrorists have killed 1,400 Syrian soldiers. The defector says it's the army using terror tactics. When you were still in the army, before you had defected, did you see the army involved in the torture of civilians? An insurgent army has recently been born as thousands of conscripted soldiers defect in the face of orders they cannot stomach. Human rights groups say most protests are still peaceful, but the Free Syrian Army is emerging as a significant military force. During our time in Syria, the foreign minister summoned the country's press to a news conference. I was invited as one of only two foreign correspondents to have official visas at that time. Attempting to play the protesters at their own game, the minister subjected us to his own gruesome video collection. The soundtrack was dramatic, as were the images. Incontrovertible evidence, it was claimed, that these armed gangs were killing soldiers and civilians. This was the government's counter-offensive against what it called the fabricated videos aired by Western and Arab TV stations. The presentation included this footage of what were claimed to be terrorists training in the area of Latakia. The men featured here have since emerged to say that they're actually all Lebanese and that they'd shot this home video of themselves training in Lebanon three years ago. Another clip turned out to be celebratory fire at a wedding. The morning after the news conference, we were invited to the palace to speak to the president's advisor. Let me just ask you on one specific thing that people are alarmed by here. There are reports that in Syria, torture is systematic. Syria has no policy of torture whatsoever. We do not have Guantanamo or Abu Ghraib. There's no policy. However, this doesn't mean that no incident at all has happened. But also, when any incident happens, people are being taken to task. There's no policy of torture or beating or doing anything like that in Syria. And the testimony of people who have spoken to the United Nations and to us journalists that there has been terrible torture committed by the security forces in this country. And do you think we, we accept uh, any, anything happening to our people? I mean, do you think that this system would accept uh, uh, torture and systematic torture? That is, that is absolutely unacceptable by us. Absolutely unacceptable.
So you reject the Absolutely. allegations? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yet delve into Syria's recent past, and torture and repression emerges central to what's kept the Assad dynasty in power for 40 years. And at the top of Syria's monolithic security apparatus, the president himself. He inherited a regime from his father, Hafez al-Assad, on which the security services had long held a vice-like grip. Bashar al-Assad took power when his father died in 2000. Many hoped he'd be a breath of fresh air. He was seen as a modernizer. He was Western educated, he was young, he understood uh, technology, he understood, um, I mean, what's happening in the world. The young reformist president was fated by Western leaders. At his side, his wife, Asma, British-born and, like her ophthalmologist husband, British educated. Earlier this year, Vogue magazine described Asma al-Assad as a rose in the desert. But Bashar al-Assad never delivered on his promise to reform. And when Syrians, inspired by other Arab nations to demand freedom, Assad mirrored his father and crushed dissent. Human rights reports have been reporting on this for many years. But the West was not listening. Because after all, the West wanted to maintain the status quo, stability. Uh, now, finally, when the great awakening uh, has taken place in the region in the last uh, year or so, uh, not only the West, but even Western public opinion has come to realize the extent and the gravity of the crisis. President Bashar al-Assad is commander-in-chief of Syria's armed forces and also in charge of the Mukhabarat. As the commander, he bears what international criminal lawyers term command responsibility. We believe and what we're addressing is the upper level of the administration. That's not to say that the very, very top is giving orders for every conduct which occurs, but certainly the information that we are receiving is that it, it, is, it is the regime, uh, the administration, that is dictating these attacks. But in a recent interview with an American television network, President Assad was still adamant that he is not responsible for the brutal crackdown. We don't kill our people. Nobody kill, no government in the world kill its people unless it's led by crazy person. For me as president, I became president because of the public support. It's impossible for anyone in this state to give order to kill. Those who've been through the torture machine know exactly who they blame. After more than a month of continuous torture, he was put in front of a judge, although he was never charged. In international law, proving command responsibility would come down to whether Bashar al-Assad knew or should have known what was going on, and perhaps more importantly, whether he did anything to stop it. Last week, Human Rights Watch claimed to have collected evidence strongly indicating the President's direct knowledge of and involvement in the violent crackdown. One thing is clear, uh, he's not stopping any of it, he's not condemning it, he hasn't opened any serious investigation into the uh, death in custody, into the rampant torture, into the overwhelming evidence of his security forces shooting protesters. Amnesty International has been documenting the regime's human rights abuse in detail ever since the revolt began. It's such a pattern of abuse against the civilian population that these do amount to crimes against humanity. And when it comes to assigning responsibility or command responsibility, how far up the chain does it go, do you think? Do you think Bashar al-Assad, the president himself, would know what's actually going on in these detention facilities? We hope that this forms what Amnesty is doing and other organizations are doing at least forms prima facie evidence of such abuses and that will hopefully form part of uh, the prosecution of Bashar al-Assad and other people who are almost certainly involved in crimes against humanity.
In terms of those numbers of torture victims, um, we have been given numbers ranging anywhere between 30,000 and 50,000. Um, I think it's more likely to be towards the upward limit than, than the bottom limit. But it's probably safe to say somewhere between 40 and 50,000 people. Ironically, Syria is party to the UN's Convention Against Torture, which defines torture as the intentional infliction of pain in order to punish, extract information, or obtain a confession. The Security Council has to issue a resolution to uh, allow or to, to grant jurisdiction on the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court to put these crimes under investigation. That is absolutely essential. The UN Human Rights Commissioner has recommended to the Security Council that Syria be referred to the International Criminal Court based on evidence of the widespread and systematic nature of killings, detentions and acts of torture which constitute crimes against humanity. The Security Council has yet to act. Syria has reached the point of no return. Uh, that is, both the opposition and the regime are going for broke. This is really a fight to the bitter end. Our investigation reveals a pattern of widespread systematic torture of Syrian civilians. Every day, extreme pain is being inflicted on thousands of Syrian men, women and children. It has become a question of how many more lives must be lost before the tyranny ends and the torture machine is switched off.